Our clicker is running again. Yay, hallelujah, just what you always wanted to hear. Yes, I know. So which of the following viruses has similar structure at the five prime end of its genome as adenovirus? Oops, let's try doing this again. That might work better. AAV2, polio, HSV, Ebola, or measles? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and talk. It's <laughs> not a problem. Uh, and we're counting down now as opposed to counting up. Viruses similar structure to the five prime end of its genome is adenovirus. What's present at the five prime end of adenovirus' genome? A what? Terminal, Terminal protein. Covalently attached to the end of it. Does AV2 have that? Does polio? DPG? HSV? No. <laughs> no, no, HSV doesn't. <laughs> um, Ebola? No, it has proteins bound at the end, but not covalently linked. And measles is the same way. So, most people liked AAV2. Um, that's got a hairpin structure at the end, but it's single stranded in a free 3 prime OH. So, that's not the case. 32% of you, however, like polio with having the protein at the end. So, <coughs> next question. The most abundant protein in adenovirus virions is PP1. Let's actually start. Um, PP1, large T antigen, hexon, penton base, or penton fiber. everybody happy, or at least most people happy. So, uh, the only sort of, you know, say, large T antigen, you know, whenever it's a question about polyomaviruses, yes, but of course large T antigen doesn't exist in these adenoviruses. Oops, so, uh, we're talking today about pox viruses, and these are the biggest 
actually of these viruses that we're going to be talking about for <coughs> the rest of the term. These are you know, quote unquote linear double stranded DNA viruses. Uh, you can also think of them as circular, single stranded that are completely complementary to each other. And I'll talk about that much more later on. Uh, these guys are almost cells in and of themselves. It's, they're pretty amazing particles. Uh, and again, you know, they're sort of the larger and larger and more complicated process we're talking about here. Very important, of course, well, at least used to be very important for human disease. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about vaccines, um, really to sort of try and hammer home vaccination. And then we'll talk a little bit about the model for messenger RNA. Basically, again, just like we had for splicing the adenoviruses, you can make lots and lots of messenger RNA with these particular viruses. So a number of people have used them for that. Vaccination, 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 vaccination. Hopefully you guys are getting it by now. And you can spread the word, the gospel thereof. <laughs> um, which reminds me, in fact, I put a link on the Edge of Life movie site about what I think everyone should know about vaccination. So um, that's there. Hairpin ends, this is something which is really pretty unique to the pox viruses, but also, as it turns out, some of the archaeal viruses we'll be talking about right at the very end of the term. There's also some connection a little bit more distant to the parvoviruses. And I think it's really kind of amazing that you know, parvoviruses have these hairpin ends, some of the smallest DNA viruses, and then some of these largest DNA viruses also have these hairpin ends. Uh, just shows that in terms of the molecular biology, you've got to deal with ends in some way if you're a DNA virus. So it doesn't matter if you're big or small, hairpins are certainly one way of dealing with that. One very important point about the messenger RNAs that are made from pox virus and pox virus infections is that there's no splicing whatsoever that takes place in them. And the reason for that is that these guys, again, are basically their own cells. They're replicating the cytoplasm. So they're completely different than any of the other DNA viruses we've talked about. If you're replicating the cytoplasm, you have to have everything that you need to make all of your messenger RNAs with the virus. So all the virus proteins have to be present in these you know, pretty big particles. The last of the sort of key concepts um, You'll see sort of interchangeably either MV or IMV or EV or EEV. And that really, <coughs> no, I can use my pointer now, uh, stands for either the mature virions or the extracellular virions. And these are really fascinating, particularly the extracellular virions, because they don't just have one envelope, which you have here in the mature virions, they just have two envelopes, one on top of each other. And so wrapped around this first, and basically this mature virion, is yet another envelope with virus-specific proteins in it. And it turns out that this is you know, somewhat bizarrely important for getting from cell to cell, whereas this one's mostly important for getting from organism to organism. And we'll look at those in, in considerably more detail. So again, a little bit about origin, disease, and vaccines at the beginning here have a little video on the eradication of smallpox. Um, hopefully people are okay with some kind of disturbing pictures of some of that disease. Fortunately, it's all gone, which is another really great thing to talk about. Um, then we'll look a little bit at the genome, replication, transcription, and release. But the, sort of the main thing here is really having to do with the vaccines and then the particles themselves. So let's look at this. This is the image, <coughs> I think, from the textbook, if I remember correctly. This is a really nice case of viral disease being known well before the actual virus had been discovered. A uh, number of Egyptian mummies older than 3,000 years old have very specific and suspicious looking scars on them. And so probably you had this virus, again, more than 3,000 years ago. Um, just a couple of quick terminology. Variola is what people call um, smallpox. Was probably together with measles, one of the reasons that most of us have whitish skin rather than other colors, uh, because in the uh, introduction of a lot of these diseases from Europe into Central and the Americas as well, 
But even in Europe, very high rates of fatality, particularly in younger children. So this was um, really a nasty disease and caused uh, great deals of, of fatality. Where do these viruses come from? It's not just smallpox, the variola disease. There are a number of different pox viruses which are out there. Most of the work that we're going to talk about today has been done on vaccinia because it doesn't cause disease. Um, curiously enough, we don't really know where it comes from. It's a, one of these sort of orphan viruses. Um, probably was a contamination of cowpox in the original vaccinations. And vaccination, of course, comes from vodka for cow. Um, but we now know exactly what cowpox is, and vaccinia is really quite different from it. So probably a contamination or just something, <coughs> the fact that we've been using this particular virus for vaccination for over 200 years. And so it's possible it's just undergone a lot of mutations since then. But the basic me take home message here is that there are lots of different <coughs> pox viruses. The other one is that the reservoir is not always the same as the host that you think about. So if you think about cowpox virus, for instance, uh, the reservoir host is actually rodents, mm -hmm. but was originally found in cows and then um, can infect humans, etc. Most of these other pox virus diseases um, really don't cause much of a disease in humans. It's just variola, which causes a, a real major problem. Variola, again, why I mentioned variola for smallpox, is that sort of the name that was used for the very original vaccinations. And so you know, Jenner is always given credit for vaccination. But really, this had to do with variolation. And in fact, Jenner knew a lot about the <coughs> variolation already. And basically all the variolation was saying is that people had noticed, uh, particularly in more civilized parts of the world at that point in time, that repeat infection was basically not a problem at all. Much, much, much lower than you would normally have from the 25% for adults and 40% for younger people. About 1% if you had a repeat infection. So relatively low. And so the idea was, okay, well let's infect people on purpose really early on, and usually when they're babies, and then they'll be resistant later on. And so this was done throughout the world, but of course, you know, 1% um, fatality rate is you know, still pretty high for that. Um, then along comes Edward Jenner, and he says, okay, you know, look, I think that because the milkmaids have this beautiful skin, um, they haven't been exposed to pox virus, that they're probably getting vaccinated um, through use of cowpox. And so that's where the vodka comes from. Originally, uh, probably was in fact cowpox, but at that point in time, you know, who knows what kinds of viruses were associated there. So there may have been a vaccinia virus in there as well. Um, and so now we've got um, vaccinia virus that we're working with. Smallpox has almost been eliminated or eradicated, made extinct. Probably one of the first examples of any life form. Again, we could argue about whether these things are alive, which we have personally wanted to completely eradicate, um, extinguish. But they were, in fact, they had the various stocks of smallpox in vials ready to go in autoclaves. Um, but then they decided to stop doing this, mostly because of bioterrorism concerns. They thought that if anyone was going to try and use one of these viruses, um, it would be better to actually know something about variola, the actual smallpox, in terms of being able to do some more research on it, which is also what people have been thinking a lot about in terms of some of these new influenza viruses that are coming along. So there are, as far as we know, two places in the world that have smallpox. One is the CDC in Atlanta. The other one is the CDC equivalent in Russia. So those are the, the two places that um, active variola are at least in freezers um, to take a look at. So this is one of my favorite pictures of vaccination. So obviously the problem is, is you get cows whenever you become vaccinated. Here's supposed to be Edward Jenner. Um, and then, you know, cows are springing out of people's buttocks. They're coming out of their arms. Um, so obviously, vaccination is an absolutely horrible idea. Um, this was in 1812. So 
resistance to vaccination has basically been around as long as vaccination has been around. Um, so this is the so-called anti-vaccine society. Um, this is what you see today, um, which, and if, well, I sort of, it's a question is laugh or cry when you actually look at this website, uh, but, you know, it's clearly anti-vaccination has been an issue for years and years and years. And this is the slide which I put on my, my website, which I think um, if you get nothing else out of this class, and I mean nothing else out of this class, this should be the main thing that you get. These are data from the CDC in 2011, so two years ago. Uh, just some numbers of annual morbidity in the U.S., again, you know, people who are getting the disease before and after vaccination. Um, some of these are bacterial, but we look here at hepatitis A, 117,000 before vaccination, 11,000 now. Measles, 530,000, 61. Polio, 16,300, zero. Smallpox, 29,000, zero. Varicella, 4,400,000. So <coughs> vaccination is, at least historically, <coughs> an extremely good thing. So that being said, um, move on and take a quick look at the video, which will hopefully emphasize this. This is from the, the Virus Hunters, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation documentary, partly with me and the fact that I was actually even in the same video with this guy, Donald Henderson, is really kind of an honor. This man is a giant. Dr. Donald Henderson accomplished what no man has ever done before. He completely wiped out a virus. And not just any virus, but the deadliest and most feared of them all. Smallpox. The virus killed 300 million people in the 20th century alone. Millions more disfigured and often blind. It's been said that smallpox has killed more people than all the wars in history combined. Donald Henderson is still haunted by memories of his own victims. The faces were anxious, there were flies all around, some were crying, some of them. You can see we're dying. The odor was just overwhelming. It was like rotting flesh. And the British physician who was with put his hands on the railing and he said, I can never do that again. I could never do rounds on these patients. That is the most horrible thing I've ever witnessed in my life.
1954, as a newly minted doctor, Donald Henderson was ready. It was a time of optimism. It was a time of delusion. These were great triumphs of public health and great triumphs of science, having these vaccines controlling these once feared and once deadly diseases. But what really happened was sort of more out of sight uh, is out of mind. They were gone only in our thoughts. Bradford faces a grim situation. In reality, outside of North America, smallpox was very much alive. In the early 1960s, there were many importations of smallpox into Europe. Part of the reason was there were big outbreaks in India and Pakistan, and they were coming across as visitors or immigrants and starting outbreaks. And I was concerned that it was going to happen in the U.S., and we, were, we hadn't had any smallpox for so many years. The world's wealthy nations, where smallpox was a fading memory, now had to face a stark truth. They would never be safe until the virus was destroyed everywhere. In 1966, the World Health Organization selected Donald Henderson as the man to do it. He was under 40, old enough to lead, yet young enough to believe. We were engaged, if you will, in a crusade to do something that had never been done before, but it could be done. When the Global Eradication Program started, there was smallpox in 43 countries. 15 million cases a year. The vaccine was scarce, and there was never enough money. All the team had was heart. They were young, they were uh, willing to spend incredible amounts of time in the field, they worked very hard, uh, and uh, let's say that they lived from the field. They were not very good at the cocktail parties. The virus had one fatal flaw. It existed only in humans. Since no animals carried it, if every human at risk could be vaccinated, smallpox could be beaten. In the first year of the program, Henderson's teams vaccinated over 25 million people on three continents. Smallpox is by far the easiest of all the diseases to eradicate. Indeed, at all. Vaccinate only once and the individual is protected. You had a vaccine that was very stable. You knew where the smallpox was all the time because everybody who could transmit the disease had a rash. A very typical rash. There were no silent carriers who could spread it. The team still had to go out and hunt it down. A photo of a baby with smallpox said everything people needed to know to help find the victims. Slowly, one needle at a time, the killer was cornered. By 1977, smallpox survived in just one country in the world, Somalia. And then in just one person, Ali Mao Mellon, a 23-year-old hospital cook in America, was the last natural case of smallpox in the world. It would ironically be a case that should never have happened. He was a young man who had been a vaccinator, but he never got himself vaccinated. Uh, and then he came down to a smallpox, and by this time he had contact. Uh, I think the count was about 110 people. Now, it was a race against time. A frantic vaccination campaign hit the streets. That one last case meant almost 55,000 people had to be vaccinated, and fast, to avoid disaster. Henderson and his team beat the odds. It was the first time in all of recorded human history that people had actually, with all of the species we had driven to extinction, actually managed to drive an infection, an infectious disease, to extinction, intentionally. Two years later, 
The war was officially declared smallpox free. The end of smallpox should not be viewed only as the closing of a magnificent chapter in international collaboration. It should also be seen as one of the launching platforms for our goal for health all by the year 2000. By the year 2000. I suppose that as people have said, it's to get to the top of the mountain. That's wonderful. But the fun was in getting <laughs> And uh, I think we all realize that we spent a lot of time in the field, with a lot of good friends, went through a lot of bad times together. And it was all over. Henderson's victory was a spectacular exception. Smallpox is still the only virus in the world that's been completely wiped out. The war on infectious diseases had really just begun. And the deadly flu viruses would be much more stubborn. So, deadly new viruses. Watch out for those. <laughs> that being said, this is um, on D2L, so you can take a look at it there. I and mean, again, we'll be looking at the flip side of that when we talk about the archaeal viruses um, right towards the end of the class. So, deep breath. <laughs> now we'll talk about the molecular viro virology here. Uh, again, this is vaccinia. Uh, this is my cartoon of the vaccinia genome. Uh, it's not obviously a cow virus. Again, it was probably a contamination or maybe it's just a lab rat who's been sitting in the lab for too many years. Uh, these are incredibly complicated virions. More than 100 proteins are actually packaged in any individual virion. So they're much, much more complicated than any of the viruses that we've talked about so far. The virions themselves are also larger than any of the virions we've talked about so far. Uh, kind of look a little bit like a, they say, a brick structure, um, more like a blob as far as I'm concerned, um, but you know, almost the size of some small cells here. Um, similarly, they have a really big genome. In the case of vaccinia, is 200,000 base pairs. So this is really long here and not at all the scale. Um, has very long inverted terminal repeats. So we just talked about those for adenovirus in the last lecture. So these are sequences which are identical on opposite strands at opposite ends of the genome. And so we'll see this turns out to be also very important for how we get replication to happen. And the last 4,000 base pairs, the very end of these genomes, is non-coding, i.e. there's no proteins which are in there. That's in contrast to the rest of the genome, which actually is pretty packed with proteins. Or say protein coding genes, I should say. Uh, and so probably it's this last little 4KB that's really important in terms of the genome replication itself. Did want to mention here these um, covalently closed ends. We'll take a little bit more uh, closer look at those right now. These ends, as well as being inverted terminal repeats, so the sequence here is going to be identical to the sequence over here. These guys are covalently closed. So it's actually just one strand of DNA. The whole thing is one strand. This is why there's, I mentioned a little bit of confusion at the beginning. You know, is this really double stranded? Is it really single stranded? Depends on how you define it. There's a little tiny bit here that's not base paired at either end of the genome. It's a four base loop here. This T is not supposed to be paired with the A because that's sort of the only way you can get around the corner here. Um, so you just loop back around completely. So you can think of this as a circular, single-stranded genome that is almost completely complementary to itself. Or you can think about it as a double-stranded, because most of it is base paired, with these end structures. A couple of interesting aspects about this end structure. One is that you've got multiple repeated structures. This is a 70 base pair sequence, which is repeated again and again and again and again. Um, multiples of these. Turns out that this varies quite a bit from virus to virus, but these repeat structures are really important for replication. And then at the very end of the genome, you're not perfectly base paired 
on either side, basically from this point on, which is about 100 nucleotides from the end, as I go down here, this is just a, um, you've got absolutely completely base paired. Whereas at the very end, you've got a couple of places which are not completely base paired with each other. Uh, if you look at the opposite ends of the genome, these are perfect matches. So an inverted terminal repeat really is the exact inverted terminal repeat. It's just that when it loops back on itself, we have a couple of mismatches. And it's these mismatches which basically say, hey, this is the end of the genome. And so for the proteins that are important for getting your genome replication, they'll see this loop structure and they'll see all these other little loops that are coming off of your particular genome. So that's the ends of the genome. What do you have in the middle of the genome? Um, this the ridiculously complicated thing here basically tells you that this was all done in the days before DNA sequencing when all you had was restriction endonucleases and could look at the various sizes of the different pieces. And mapping was absolutely critical to figure out where these things were in the genome. But basically here, the replication proteins are on the middle of the genome. So this is different from almost all of the other viruses we've talked about so far. Um, although herpes virus, they're also pretty well distributed in the rest of the genome. Uh, but here, they're smack dab in the middle, and that's probably because at these ends of the genome, you've got these sort of the mismatches, the different base pairs. You're not going to be able to transcribe something that's got mismatches in it. So here, you're pretty protected from any kind of problems that you would have in terms of transcribing any of these genes. Uh, there are a couple of things to look at here. Um, certainly, these are the proteins that you'll need to make more genome. Again, these guys are replicating in the cytoplasm, so you need basically everything. You need capping enzymes, you need primases, you need RNA polymerases, you need decapping enzymes, you need <coughs> basically everything that you possibly could need for not only making DNA, but also making your RNA, because all of this is happening with just the virus genome. The other thing to bear in mind here is that these are a whole mixture of early and late genes. This is very similar to the herpes viruses, where the early and late genes are really kind of mixed in through the whole genome. And that means that you've got very specific regulation for these early, middle, and late genes, so as opposed to having, okay, you know, your early genes are at one end of the genome, the late genes are at the other end of the genome, and the simpler viruses. These here, you have to have this very specific regulation, and we'll see what that regulation is in just a couple of minutes. What do these particles look like? Again, I mentioned this right at the beginning. You've either got the mature virus particles or the intracellular mature virus particles. These have one membrane around the outside and are incredibly stable, and that's one of the big issues with smallpox and smallpox spread is that these particles, which is this single membrane around the outside, are stable to drying out, you can, you know, and they spread really, really easily, at least from person to person. And so this is a big problem in terms of virus spread, but it turns out it's really good as far as vaccines are concerned, because you can freeze dry the vaccine, vaccinia, for decades, and it's perfectly happy. So the, uh, the current version, in fact, of the vaccinia vaccine is called Drybax because you literally completely dry it out and these things are perfectly happy uh, and give you immune response, but also are replicated. And again, you know, one of the important things about vaccinia is it's an actual functional virus. So it can replicate, it does undergo infections, and so that's why you're getting the kind of immune response that you do. Now, it's not an attenuated virus, it's not taking variola and then getting more, or say, going through multiple rounds of replication and less infectivity, but it's a pretty similar in that kind of case. It's an active virus that you're getting then resistance to the related virus. On the other hand, you also have these extracellular, and actually this is now mature virus, should be enveloped virus here. These guys have two membranes around them, which again, is completely unique as far as viruses that we know of, that has an extra membrane around the outside. What do these virus particles look like? Um, all kinds of fascinating internal structures. 
People usually don't think about having viruses having internal structures, uh, but these do quite exactly what's going on here is not entirely sure. Um, we've got great electron microscopy. What we don't have is ways of identifying in the electron microscope what each of these blobs actually happen to be. Um, so we've got these two. The mature virus particles, again, most important for spreading disease, so from organism to organism. And we'll see what these extracellular envelope particles are important for a little bit later on. When you get infected, so you have one of these mature virus particles that enters a cell. Cell entry seems to be pretty much by membrane fusion that happens at the external membrane. You release this core structure. And this is basically, I like to think this is kind of an organelle that comes inside the cell because you can get pretty much everything that happens with your pox viruses from this core. You have the early messenger RNAs. These early messenger RNAs will then activate the early protein genes. Remember, these are mixed in throughout the whole genome. Not surprisingly, the early genes are important for DNA replication. DNA replication, you also then have expression of the intermediate messenger RNAs, which then express the intermediate proteins. These then are going to activate the late messenger RNAs, and you end up with the late proteins. Late proteins are the structural proteins, so just like you have in all these other viruses. But interestingly enough, you also have a number of proteins here which are going to be regulating way back up here. So if you look at the specific proteins that they mention here, these are now the viral um, transcription factors. And so these are going to be the intermediate transcription factors, but the transcription factor you need to make the next set of proteins. And so your early protein include the intermediate transcription factors, because these are going to be regulating the intermediate genes, which you have here, which will be then regulating the late transcription factors. Then your late messenger RNAs will be encoding early transcription factors, because these are the things that you need way back over here. So it's unfortunately a little confusing that your early transcription factor is a late messenger RNA. That makes sense? No? Yes? Yeah. Nod? confused. Okay, so when we have all of our late proteins which are being expressed, we have these so-called virus factories. We'll see more about the virus factories when we talk about some of the other even bigger viruses later on. This is really a part of the cell, also kind of an organelle, which is putting together lots and lots of virus particles. You undergo maturation and then you basically have two processes. You can either have your virus with one membrane on it, or you can also get viruses that end up with two membranes on them. This is the case here where we've got our virus with two membranes. The virus with one membrane is what you end up with there. Let's take a look at how that happens. So, sorry. First look at what you have packaged here. I already mentioned the transcription factors. So these transcription initiation factors are late genes, but of course you need them in the virus particle to be able to express your early genes when you undergo an infection. These early genes, basically these are transcriptional activators, they act on a viral RNA polymerase. How many other viruses we talked about with their own viral RNA polymerase? One, way back when. The one that people use for biotechnology all the time? T7. T7, exactly. Yeah, way back, oh my god, that was like before the first midterm. Uh, so yes, they have their own RNA polymerase. Big difference with the T7 RNA polymerase. How many subunits does the T7 RNA polymerase have? One. One. We've got eight here. So it turns out this RNA polymerase is much more similar to the eukaryotic RNA polymerases than it is to something like the bacteriophage T7 RNA polymerase. Right, one, two, and three. Well, this is now just a viral split. So the question was, um, is it like RNA polymerase two, I guess? Uh, but these are now viral specific polymerases. RNA polymerases one, two, and three are all in the nucleus. This is in the cytoplasm. So it turns out that it functions like a RNA polymerase two. 
because it's making a bunch of messenger RNAs, um, and it's still using the cellular translation machinery. So yeah, this is basically sort of your, your virus that does everything except translation. And that's what you need RNA polymerase 1 and RNA polymerase 3 for, are the ribosomal RNAs and the tRNAs. So it's basically functioning like an RNA polymerase 2. Uh, caps your messenger RNAs, termination, um, polyadenylation, etc. All of these things that you need to make RNAs that the cell can translate. Because that's all non-viral as far as uh, this virus. Is. But basically everything else is already there. Um, also have their own DNA polymerization. Again, not terribly surprising. This list, I don't expect you to remember all of it, but has everything you need that you need to do DNA replication, and they're all virus encoded. Every single one of these is virus encoded. Of course, these guys, you don't have to have in the virus particle because you can make the messenger RNAs. You have your RNA polymerase, you make the messenger RNAs. That then will lead to transcription and then translation of all these genes. So these are the intermediate genes that you have. Um, also, people talk about them as middle genes. And the Pox virologists call them intermediate genes. I think middle is an easier way to think about it. So how do you regulate these genes? Again, not terribly surprising. We talked about this already. You've got the early transcription factors, the intermediate transcription factors, and the late transcription factors. These are present in the virion. These are your early genes, because you need them to express the late genes. These late genes, this is the transcription factors, one of these intermediate genes. All of these are going to be post-replication in terms of getting, I should say, these guys, BITF and BLTF, are post-replication, but these guys are already in the virion. So, uh, but these early genes, again, are leading to your replication. Everything's happening in the cytoplasm. And so that's the you know, reason, of course, that you've got, you have to have all of these individual genes. And this brings up a really interesting question that nobody has a good answer to is, well, where did this come from? And where did they get all the nucleotides? Pardon? Where did they get all the nucleotides? The nucleotides? Right. The so, yeah. Genome? So that's actually a great question. Ribonucleotide reductase is one of the genes that they express a lot of. This went back a slide for those of you who are just listening. Uh, Ribonucleotide reductase, what does that do? Breaks up the cell RNA. Breaks up cellular RNA, makes that RNA into DNA, which you need to replicate your virus with. So it uses all of these cellular messenger RNAs. And so those extra nucleotides, they're all taken from the cytoplasm. So it doesn't have to then go into the nucleus where you're going to have all of those deoxyribonucleotides. So it's a very good question. The RNA polymerase, so I guess I was just sort of asking about so where this came from. Anybody's guess. Uh, you have to think about where viruses originally evolved. Is this an escaped cell? Is it something which developed in parallel with cellular organisms? I think it's a really interesting open question, and lots of people will debate it. And again, after the term's over, we can go and drink some beers and, and talk about it. <laughs> so, <coughs> but not until afterwards. Uh, and all the grades are posted. Um, one of the things that for me is actually, I think, leading towards this second theory that's a parallel evolution, as it were, is that the pox virus RNA polymerase is similar to these eukaryotic RNA polymerases, but all of these extra general transcription factors, everything else is really virus-specific. So maybe it's just been evolving for a really long time, or it's something which is a little bit separate. So we've got these <laughs> viral transcription factors and general transcription factors. So these function in very similar ways to the TF2, like TF2D, TF2B, et cetera, proteins that you find with RNA polymerase 2. You've got a nice bent piece of DNA, just like you do when the Tata binding protein was going to bind to the DNA. But instead of having a nice, simple Tata box, it's very different sequences that you have here between minus 30 and plus 1. And these are all different relative to the early, intermediate, and late genes. So each of them have different promoter structures, which again is not terribly surprising because you know, you've got these different transcription factors for the early, intermediate, and late genes. 
Again, this is sort of a reminder here. Again, all of this is happening in the cytoplasm. So if you want your messenger RNAs to be functional, be able to be used by the cellular translation machinery, you have to give them caps and poly A tails. And this happens again all through the virus proteins. So the virus proteins are doing all of these jobs. So that's, you know, again, you're dependent on the cellular translational machinery, but you've got this funky double-stranded hairpin ends or single-stranded completely complementary genome. How do you replicate that? That's not like the cell at all. Again, yeah, we've got hairpin ends, we've got these um, ITRs, maybe similar to these really tiny viruses, and I just pulled up the figure from the textbook on the parvovirus replication. This should now look extremely similar to what we have in terms of the pox virus replication. Here, however, we don't have a free 3' OH, but we can make a free 3' OH by just making a little nick in the DNA close to the hairpin end. You remember, that's where you have all these mismatches. And so it's a very specific structure that you have there that can then be recognized by one of these nicking enzymes. That was going to provide you a 3' OH and a template. So now you can replicate out to the end of the genome. This, just like you have with the parvoviruses over here, is self-complementary. So it can bind back to itself. And then this provides a 3' OH. You can replicate your way down all the way to the opposite end of the genome. But here, there's no end, unlike you have with the parvoviruses. You keep going and end up making multiple copies of these genomes that are linked together to each other as concatenars. Remember we talked about concatenars before? So here we've got two of these genomes hooked together. Now remember this is about 400 KB. It's a pretty darn long piece of DNA. Um, and then you need to separate these concatenars into individual genome length segments. You do that through the so-called resolution. Resolution is a lot like what you get with homologous recombination. After you've had crossing over that takes place, you undergo holiday junction resolution. You cut two strands, re-ligate them to each other. Turns out that the proteins are extremely similar that do this in the pox virus replication and in the homologous recombination pathways that we have before. already talked a little bit about the messenger RNAs, how you get the particular poly A tails. It turns out that this RNA polymerase itself is kind of like some of the RNA polymerases that you have in negative strand RNA viruses. They stutter a little bit, so you end up with extra long poly A tails. Um, but again, this is not the same enzyme that you're using for replication, so you don't have to change the structure at all. It's just the nature of the RNA polymerase. When it gets to a stretch of T's, it's just going to put in a whole bunch of A's. Uh, and then in some cases, uh, your termination codon um, is then being read through. And that really has to do more with these um, stuttering. And again, just it's, a, it's a property of the RNA polymerase. So it's not like RNA polymerase 2, which once it gets to a certain point, then that stops. You get your poly A tail addition. Here, it gets to a stretch of keys and then just sort of sits there, um, plugs away at them, and then eventually is going to fall off of your template. So it's also nowhere near as persessive as the RNA polymerase too. So we've made our messenger RNAs, we've made our genome, then we need to put our viruses together, and this is where you have these so-called virus factories. Um, and basically, this is just part of the cell. It you know, kind of looks like a separate organelle that forms after virus infection, where you have partial pieces of membrane which are coming together. So this is going to be your very first step in virus replication. Then you start to put together your core structure, which you can see down here is these black dots in the lower right of the slide. And then, Finally, you start to assemble these particles. These are your mature virions, 
with this very typical core-like structure, kind of a dumbbell in the middle of your structure. And then these guys can either be released directly, and those would be your mature virions, or they end up picking up an extra envelope. Um, one way you can see virus factories, um, let's see, you know, iron cell organelles are gone. Um, this is what you used to do in the days before we had much better electron microscopy. Now you can actually literally see where these viruses are forming. But they do form in a very specific part of the cell. This is something that we saw way back when we were talking about polio. They like to replicate vesicles. Um, again, so concentrating the virus replication in one part of the cell with these really relatively large virions, it's a lot easier to see where these guys are. So how do you get these vaccinia viruses out? Again, it's just a cartoon of what we just looked at on that last slide. In the virus factories, you have formation of the viral proteins. They're inserted into membranes in the Golgi. This then has a viral membrane surrounded by an external membrane because it's still come off of the Golgi structure. Once this guy actually fuses with the cell membrane, you'll release a mature virus particle with just one membrane around the outside. So that's not what is shown here. In some cases, and it turns out both of these are equally infectious, you end up with yet another membrane that forms around the outside of these virus particles. And if you think about it, that last membrane on the outside, that's what's going to end up fusing with the plasma membrane out here. And then releasing the virus particle. These enveloped viruses now have these two membranes on the outside of them. Well, they have two membranes on the outside before they fuse with the plasma membrane. They actually have to have three membranes around them. So these virus particles, before they fuse with the external membrane, have three lipid bilayers around. Then fuse with the membrane, you've got these two lipid bilayers. So why do you bother with having this extra lipid bilayer on the outside? As I mentioned right at the beginning, there's some virus-specific proteins that stick in this lipid bilayer. And the reason that they do this has to do with rocket ships. We were just talking about this in you know, chemistry the other day. So it turns out that these enveloped viruses, and particularly the proteins that are in that extra envelope around the outside, they cause polymerization of actin. And so literally what happens is you have the virus particle, which is actually, you can see here, uh, stained in red in this micrograph. Um, this then causes polymerization of actin behind it and you literally shoot the virus particle in you know, the lower right here. There's the virus particle. Here's this actin filament, which is formed behind that virus to literally push it into, presumably, the next cell, which is sitting next to it. Like a slingshot? Yeah, basically kind of like a, well, actually sort of like building up stuff behind it to shoot it across the, the next couple of memory. It's really neat. Uh, and there are some wonderful videos. I tried to find some online last night, but I wasn't able to do so. Yeah. Is that just the same process that some bacteria use to propel themselves around inside the cell? Listeria, exactly. Very, very similar process. Turns out it's a slightly different protein, but it's exactly the same process. And there's some great listeria ones. Yeah, like that nucleation protein. Um, so very similar process. And again, um, these are having to do with those uh, proteins that are present in that extra membrane. Yeah. So what's triggering the virion to uh, make the extra membrane? Oh, triggering the virion, so if we back up um, here, this particular step um, seems to be relatively stochastic. You know, some viruses go this way and some viruses go that way. Um, as far as I know, there's no particular regulation for that. But if you're interested in more details, I have the email address of the guy who wrote this chapter, so you, know, you can send me an email. I'm confused by that picture because this one? it yeah. looks like it's a Golgi, like you can see where it's getting the actual viral membrane. Mm -hmm. Is it flexing around it a vesicle? I'm not sure I'm quite fond. So basically you, you produce this you know, regular virus particle and this could go out and fuse with the membrane. You've got a single uh, membrane around your normal mature virus. So again, this is the one that usually is causing disease being released here. But you can see but the red things on the Golgi and then it's right. surrounded by a black membrane. 
Oh, this one? Yeah. Here? Yeah, so this would be your normal process that you would be undergoing. And so when you get you know, formation of your virus particle in here, this should actually be flipped around on the outside. And so when you see so your virus is normally in the cytoplasm, mm -hmm. right? So it's going to be getting this membrane. And then that then is going through the normal secretion process. And so we've looked at a number of enveloped viruses. This would be your normal enveloped virus process right. that happens here. Then in some cases, and again, this is the big difference with the pox viruses, this then guy goes back to the Golgi and picks up another membrane. And so basically buds back into the Golgi. And it does it on the opposite side of the Golgi apparatus. So the cis versus the transfer. Yeah? Um, does it have any receptors that it uses on other cells? Or is it like is it shooting out using the actin? I mean, if it just, is it just launching into the next cell? Or does it actually... Yeah, it seems to be just pretty much launching into the next cell right next to it, and that's probably you, why you don't have to worry about receptors. You just punch your way through the, the next membrane. It's kind of an amazing process. <laughs> oh, yeah, a question down here. Then so it gets used. Is the red um, little thing, is that where another membrane is? Um, this or another, here? another envelope for the um, virus? That, well, yeah. The this one, well, so this is, this is the, the first envelope that you have on a mature yeah. virus particle. Okay. Then you've got this one, which is from the Golgi. This so will be your normal secretion vessel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so here, this can go straight to the membrane and fuse, and you're released with one virus particle. Okay. Or it can go back to the Golgi, pick up some of these proteins that are involved in actin polymerization, and then, and it's not shown here, but that would be then in this membrane. And so that then is released. So that reason it picks up more actin protein. Back to nucleation protein, yeah, right here. But is that similar to the autophagy then that happens inside of cells, or is it something completely different where it revisits the Golgi specifically? To be perfectly honest, I don't know. Um, it might be, and I can try and look it up and try and tell you next time. But it is actin driven though, the, the wrapping of this extra. No, no, so the, act, the actin formation is after this, it's this oh. arrow right here, which is the active process. Okay, other questions on this? Is yeah. kind of a confusing aspect about the, the pox viruses. How does it get the actin again? Pardon? Oh, so the actin, which is, is, is involved here. So this is this is in the case of the absence of actin. And here are the virus particles. And just your standing for actin, so these um, green streaks. And so how it's getting the actin is that is the one of the membrane proteins of the outside of those external um, enveloped viruses. And so that then causes the polymerization of actin right behind the virus. And so here's an actin tail right here, and there's the virus particle. But it causes the polymerization of actin. And that polymerization of actin can cause all these big differences in the cell. And here you can see all of these vaccine particles trying to get out. Question? Yeah, so that active polymerization doesn't happen in because it picks up all that stuff. Right, it's only that e that extra membrane, and so in the normal mature virus you don't have those, but in the enveloped virus you do. Okay, oops. Pardon? We've got five minutes left. Ask me some more questions. So, yeah. What was your question? Yeah. So that's just released from the cell. And that then is presumably, that's what happens when you have the uh, pox on the outside. And so that's where you've got the release of these really desiccation resistant particles. And so that's from an organism, the organism spread point of view. Okay, that's it. How does it keep itself from degrading? Like if it can go into like a, did you say you could dry it out and keep it for decades? Is the mechanism that keeps it from degrading them? Oh, why? Why did you get degradation? Yeah. Um, probably because it's really tightly packed inside there, and so there's very little water, and you need water for almost all of the hydrolytic activities that you would have to have, and so it just seems to be that packing process. Okay, so again, the, the people talk about these things as bricks. I don't see I can build anything with these brick-like particles. Um, they really look much more like blobs to me than anything else. <laughs>